forward. Perfect. All right. All right, thank you guys for joining us this evening. Welcome to Butterflies 101. We are here with Karen and Steve McCurdy. Um, we've got a great presentation lined up for you guys, courtesy of them. Uh, just real quick, some housekeeping stuff. We encourage all kinds of questions. Please go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat at the end of the presentation. I'll be reading these out loud. Uh, so hang around if you guys have any questions towards the end. And uh, we want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, uh, Steel. With their sponsorship, we're able to host all these free programs, like the one this evening. Uh, we encourage you guys to check out the rest of the programming we have this week as well um, in support of our virtual butterfly festival. And we also have some more free programs coming up throughout October and November as well. Um, but with that, again, just feel free to put those questions in the chat. And we ask you guys just keep videos off and stay muted. Um, but other than that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our wonderful presenters. So see if we want the, we'll get your uh, screen shared, ready to go up there and can go ahead with the presentation. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Well, okay, there we go. All right. Does that look good, Alex? You can see it, right? Looks good to me. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we are delighted to be here this evening to kick off the 2021 Virtual Butterfly Festival. Mm -hmm. People often ask us, uh, how did you get interested in butterflies? This is a photo of our son, Ryan, um, seven at the time and 37 now. Uh, and this is the very first butterfly we ever raised, a golf fritillary there on my finger. Um, we, you know, this came about accidentally, actually. Um, at this point in our lives, we knew very little about butterflies. But I had gone out onto, we were living in Marietta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. I had gone out onto our uh, upper deck and I saw these little brown things hanging under the railing. Did not have a clue what they were. We did a little research, found out that they were Gulf Fritillary chrysalises, more on that later. And then we found out that they had to have been made by Gulf Fritillary caterpillars who eat only passion vine. So I went down a couple of deck levels to the ground and found that indeed we did have passion vine growing there. That meant, means that those caterpillars had to have traveled like 30 feet yep. Yep. Uh, to the upper deck to make those chrysalises. So we're like, well, this is cool. So we brought in a few caterpillars and this was the result, our first successful butterfly. So we went out to release it um, and it soared high into the heavens, made a big circle around our house, came back and landed right on my hand and looked at me as if to say, are you my mother? And needless to say, we were hooked. So fast forward 30 years and we are still raising butterflies and moths uh, at this point several dozen different species, typically in a year. Um, and, you know, on the left here, you see I've got some Eastern tiger swallowtails, Virginia state insect, giving me some kisses. Uh, and just coincidentally, it didn't plan it this way, but the t-shirt that I have on, that top caterpillar there is an Eastern tiger uh, caterpillar who is turned from green to brown because it's ready to pupate. More on that later. And then, of course, Steve has a monarch there on his finger. So you might say that, you know, this is 30 years later. It's still our, our hobby, our passion. Some might call it an obsession. Yeah. 
Um, so we uh, moved from Charlotte, North Carolina to Virginia Beach uh, in 2003. And we found out there were other people like us and there was a whole organization for them. So we joined the Butterfly Society of Virginia and uh, we do invite you to uh, visit uh, the Butterfly Society's website. There's a wealth of information there. We also have a very active Facebook page. So we hope you'll check both of those out. Um, and we are now in our 13th year of serving uh, on its board and we are the uh, immediate past co-presidents. Then in 2016, we found out that there was a group that's basically for people who love all things na uh, nature. Mm -hmm. And we became um, certified Virginia master naturalist uh, in the uh, local Tidewater chapter. We volunteer extensively through both organizations doing presentations like this. Uh, and educational displays at, at many events, um, and also uh, have served many years uh, as docents uh, in the amazing Norfolk Botanical Garden Butterfly House, which I believe is open through the end of September, and it is a real treasure. Oh, and I should say is uh, the manager of it is a Butterfly Society board member, Lauren Tafoya. Okay, hang on to your hats. We are now going to talk about the life cycle of Lepidoptera. Tonight's topic is butterflies. Um, butterflies are part of the Lepidoptera family along with moths and uh, skippers. And uh, er everything is fairly consistent among them. I'm gonna focus on the butterflies. So there might be some things that are just a tiny bit longer or shorter for some of the others, but We'll begin with the egg up here. And uh, the, the eggs just for a scope of size for butterflies are typically smaller than the head of a pin. So um, when, when we're going out, we're looking for something very, very small on a leaf where the, the egg has been laid. Uh, the, the, the egg hatches um, in butterflies usually in, an, in, in just a matter of a few days. And uh, the, the larva, which is the next phase in the complete metamorphosis. In other words, this is full metamorphosis that the butterflies go through. And the larva is the next stage. And it is also called, we call them caterpillars. And their job is to eat. Uh, they have mandibles. We'll see that in, in just a minute. And they are... Their, their purpose is to convert the carbohydrates that are in the plant leaves that they're on into protein. And, and that's very important for, for them and for their, their uh, purpose on here. So they eat so much and so fast that they actually fill their skin up and they have, like a snake, they have to shed the skin and, and get a larger one and they do that five times. It's called in stars, the stages uh, between the sheds. And so they will do it five times. And, uh, and then finally, they finally get full. Uh, they've had enough to eat. They take a little walk around. They've got to walk for a little while because they got a long body full of food. They can't take the food into the next stage. So they, they walk around for a bit, kind of like after Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, they purge what's left over inside their gut, and then they go to the next stage. So what they do is move to pupation. Pupa is the next stage, and pupa is where the magic happens. Now let's let's talk about what the the caterpillars are eating. Again, their their job is to eat and eat and eat. Each of them is on a different plant specific to the species of caterpillar, and that's called a host plant. So the, the caterpillars are eating host plants. They come into the magic stage here, the pupa stage, and in butterflies, we call it a chrysalis. When you hear about moths later in the week, uh, that's Wednesday night? Yes. And Wednesday night, you'll hear about moths, and, and they are called pupas in the moths, but it's, it's all the pupa stage. So the chrysalis stage is can be as short as about a week. It, it, 
in certain instances is, is much longer. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and, and things really happen in there. And so that's why I say that's where the magic happens. Eventually the butterfly will, you know, an adult butterfly will emerge from the chrysalis and will fly around and their main job is to reproduce. And so um, they are going to mate and then the female is going to lay eggs. And uh, one of the things uh, in, in, in their case is the adults do not eat any leaves. They, they're, they, for sustenance, they drink nectar. And nectar is something that plants produce to attract um, uh, pollinators to it. It's sweet, it's basically sugar water. So it attracts the pollinators. So the adults, they're, they're just basically um, uh, sipping on, on some uh, sweet, the, the caterpillars are chewing their host plants. And those are the two important things to remember about them. And Maurice Cullen, uh, current president of the Butterfly Society is doing uh, a talk tomorrow night more about uh, gardening. And, and, and he'll be talking and about- Specifically about host and nectar plants. And so, too. and he will jump into host and nectar plants. Mm -hmm. We wanted to explain kind of why they were important in, in the whole butterfly life cycle. So this is, now you saw a Eastern tiger swallowtail big, bright, and yellow in, in the earlier introduction. This is what's called the dark form tiger. And you're going to hear later why she is dark. You can see a little bit of the yellow semblance in her leaves. The most important striking feature about her is her antenna. In her wings. Uh, oh, in her wings. wings. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Miss, yeah. yeah. On her wings. On her wings. The, the most striking feature is her antenna. Uh, think of these as noses up on the top because this is how she smells. And the thing she's going to smell is flowers. She uh, also, some butterflies emit pheromones to attract a member of the opposite sex. And so that's a way that they can locate each other. Um, very distinctive on a butterfly is this large eye. It is a compound eye. It has many, many lenses in it. And the purpose of that is each lens refracts things coming in slightly different and they can pick up motion very clearly and are able to dodge birds and other predators coming at them. Um, probably one of the oddest looking things here is there is no mouth and in the place where the mouth would be is the proboscis which comes out and it goes, they use it to essentially drink the nectar out of flowers. And so when they're flying, they keep it coiled up out of the way. And then when they come on a flower, they unfold the proboscis and put it in. The proboscis functions kind of like a straw. Down at the end, it's, uh, it's got kind of capillary action. They can suck either directly out of the nectar source or off of something moist, but they suck it up in, into their body. But since they have no mouth and they, um, they can't taste, uh, so they have to be able to know where they are and if they're on the right plant. So to find a flower or the host plant that mama's got to found to lay the eggs on for her caterpillars, they have the taste sensors on their feet and, and on their legs. And so you'll see later where they're tasting the leaf and then moving on with it. Um, a butterfly is an insect. It has six legs. So there are six legs all folded up here. As she's holding on to dear life to get a drink of nectar here. And, and one of the interesting things about this picture is all this uh, beige color stuff on her is actually pol pollen. And uh, butterflies are accidental pollinators. They uh, fly along, they get a sip of nectar, the pollen collects on them, they go to the next flower and they transfer the pollen to them. Okay, this is a video of a giant that is nectaring and she is placing her proboscis into each of these little florets and just getting a good sip out of each of them. Whoop. And these are two guys that are puddling and this is a, um, come on baby. This is a, a, a Palamedes swallowtail here, and, and this is a spicebush swallowtail. Uh, both of them are males. It's something males do. You can see the proboscis coming down and going onto the, into the, the wet. 
So there are minerals in the soil. They are uh, dis dissolved into the, the moisture and they're bringing those salts and minerals in. And basically when they transfer their sperm to the female, they include these salts and that supercharges the effect. Okay, let's look at what uh, how a ca caterpillar is organized here. We have the head and here are the mandibles, the jaw. This is what they chew with. And, and that's basically their main function. Uh, they are not going to run away from a predator, and so they don't need good eyes. And so all they have here is simple eyes rather than the compound eyes of the butterfly. They are an insect, six legs right here, three pairs for six legs, but they're so long, they would fall off the tree or off the leaf. So they need something to hold on. And so they have claspers here, which are called prolegs, a group of prolegs in the abdomen here, and then an anal proleg pair. And they basically function to clamp on. And we can see that right here. Um, here are the mandibles. Here are the six insects leg, insect legs. And then here are those prolegs, which help clamp on. Now, they. They, they breathe through the sides of their bodies. And if you look at these little ovals right here, those are spiracles and the oxygen goes into the cavity inside the, the caterpillar uh, in exchange for CO2 and, and then it, it comes back out. And that's actually a Luna moth caterpillar, and, but a larger caterpillar is easier to show the, that anatomy on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this, this is a tiger swallowtail caterpillar. We got him so you can see his little eyeballs right here, very teeny tiny. Some people say, oh, look at that cool eye. Oh, that's a fake eye. That's for predators. You will see more of that in a little bit. Okay. These guys are monarch caterpillars. This one has just finished eating and is resting before he goes back at it. This is in, in actual time, that's how fast they eat. It's, it's like eating an ear of corn, just chewing down on the uh, um, milkweed, chewing leaf. That, milkweed mm -hmm. leaf. Uh, and milkweed is the host plant for the monarch caterpillar. Since there is a cat, uh, monarch talk on Friday night, we're really not gonna talk much about monarchs tonight. So you'll see all about them on Friday night. Okay, each female, butterfly typically has 300 more eggs and we sometimes some species get four generations here and and that varies among generations and so if we assume that half of the 300 of the first um, generation are females that means we get 150 females second generation we potentially have 22,000 females third generation up oh, or over 3 million and then fourth generation the females plus the males means a billion potential butterflies. And that's from beginning with one female because she has 300 eggs. Holy cow, that'd be a lot of caterpillars to feed. But there's somebody that keeps that from being a problem. And that's this guy here. He loves caterpillars. As a matter of fact, baby birds have to have protein. They cannot eat seeds. They have to have protein. And if you remember, the caterpillars convert carbohydrates into protein. And so, ha, let's feed them to the baby birds. And that's in fact what happens. Doug Tallamy, probably a lot of you know who Doug is. He uh, has, has he's written a couple of books, Bringing Nature Home was his first big blockbuster. And he focused a camera on a clutch of hatchlings, uh, chickadee hatchlings. That's, there were four of them in there. And fortunately, he had grad students to watch all the video and count all the insects that were brought to the nest. It was over 5,000. And subsequent reports has been almost eight or 9,000. Uh, most of those were caterpillars. And so that is a lot. So in effect, 100% of the, the, the eggs that get laid don't he, uh, turn out to um, become caterpillars and thus adults, but only about 2% of them do. So instead of having 150, we have 2% of it, which means we get three in the first generation, about nine in the second generation, third in the, in, or 27 in the third, and 163. And we can compare a billion potential offspring, and finally about 163. Um, What's in, another thing that's very important to Doug is a concept that has come out in his newer book, Nature's Best Taupe. This is a great book, came out right before the pandemic. 
so uh, he, he has a call for the homegrown national park. He tells a great story about how he got the computing acreage. If everybody just put a little bit of, of park in their backyard, habitat in their backyard, and you added it all together, you'd have a huge national park. Coincidentally, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, it used to be the Game and Inland Fisheries Group, they've got a call to action, restore the wild, plant habitat. So everyone's telling us we got to plant habitat, and that's the host plants, and that is the nectar plants. Really quickly, this is uh, three backyards. This one has a pool and not many, not much of anything that's good to a butterfly, no host plants, no nectar plants. This one has a tree in the middle and, and a little bit along the edge. So that's a couple of host plants, but this one's got a whole backyard full of host plants and it has a bunch of flowering plants along here because I know really well. And all these white things are bags of mulch being put out on the, the um, uh, yards. So here we have a, a group of flowers growing, a group of butterflies. If you're if you in a trivia contest, rabble is a group of butterflies or the word kaleidoscope because there are so many different colors. Uh, really quickly, early in the season, the garden has a lot, needs a lot of color. Uh, nectar to attract the butterflies. We have bee balm or a monarda growing in a patch right back here. We got a little flea bane here. We got a little yarrow up front just over to the right, which you can't see. Uh, we got a patch of mountain mint that's getting ready to, to go crazy. Mountain mint's one of the greatest uh, nectar sources for small pollinators. So bees, wasps, and small butterflies and the skippers go crazy over that. Um, and we also have some milkweed. This is common milkweed coming up in, in the midst of everything. Some of it's going to bloom and milkweed's one of those two for plants. It's the host plant for the monarch and its flowers are for any butterfly. And again, that's the special thing about nectar plants. Virtually any butterfly can nectar off of any nectar plant. Later in the season, we planted some zinnias here in the front, and then I got a hold of some super cosmos, and these things are great. They are covered all day long. And oh, you want to oh, talk about? Oh, and you, oh, I just didn't want you to fail it. Uh, yeah. That out. Up here in the in the tree is a a, a vine growing, and and Karen's going to talk about that in just a few minutes. That is uh, a Dutchman's pipe vine. And I have a rule in my yard, I plant things and then I let the plant decide where it wants to go. And this one wanted to go up in the tree, it gets the right amount of sun for it to live well. Uh, these are some cosmos that I got earlier in the season. Uh, that's a red spotted purple that's uh, nectaring uh, joyously on it. So flowers, flowers, flowers for the adults. So here we are, Steve and me going out into the garden. Um, Working, playing, it's hard to yeah, tell the difference sometimes. Uh, but let's, let's head into the garden to take a look at some of the most common butterflies in Tidewater, Virginia, and how you can attract them to your yard. Uh, we're going to start with all of the swallowtails. Um, this is very common uh, eastern black swallowtail. Here, this is a female, and she is nectaring on the scabiosa or pincushion flower. This is a male nectaring on yarrow. Again, on the left is the male. The female is on the right. Uh, some like to say she has a blue skirt. Uh, this species is sexually dimorphic, which means that you know, they have very obvious color differences um, and sometimes size differences, which help tell the sexes apart. In other species, it's a little harder. And they are nectaring on a wonderful nectar plant, um, the uh, Homestead Purple Verbena. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve, if you could also point out, yes, right, and the, uh, there's also some flocks in that photo. Uh, that's a wonderful early nectar plant. It's, you really need to try to have nectar throughout, you know, from spring to as late as you can in the fall. And this is how it all starts. Uh, as Steve said, a female is going to have uh, typically at least 300, maybe three to 500 eggs. She is born with all of her eggs, but she does need to uh, have them fertilized through mating. Once that is done, she will go about searching for the right host plants 
for her caterpillars. And in the case of the Eastern black swallowtail, it is anything in the carrot family. Uh, this is fennel. Uh, that family also includes, of course, carrot tops, uh, parsley, dill, Queen Anne's lace, and there's a wonderful native plant called Zizia that is in the carrot family. So here she's found it. She had scratched at it with her tarsal claws on her feet. As Steve said, that's where their taste buds are. And she said, this is, this is the right plant. And she's curved her abdomen and has deposited an egg. Here's some ripening eggs. And then here's some early instars on what kind of looks like a little uh, Christmas tree of, of fennel. Uh, all swallowtail caterpillars have that orange thing that they can evert from their prothoracic segment. It's called an osmotarium. Uh, it is a defensive uh, gland. Uh, and if, if that doesn't scare off predators, uh, it also emits a really stinky smell. Okay, now this caterpillar is actually a spice for swallowtail has turned yellow. It, it was green previously, has turned yellow, and it's doing something. It's moving its heads back and forth. It's weaving a little strand of silk. And you see right back here is a bunch of silk on this case. He started here, and he's got this strand he's got going all the way around. He's going to come back and make a big loop of silk here. And so he doesn't fall down. He first, first puts some silk down here and put his uh, anal pro legs into it. And so He's going back, he'll go back and forth for 30 minutes to an hour, reinforcing this strand. And this is making what's called a girdle. And ooh, let's get rid of that message. Um, we can see here that this is a caterpillar that has attached its, its anapro legs into a bed of silk and has woven a very strong girdle here. That girdle is so strong, if you went up and grabbed a hold of the caterpillar and tried to pull it off, it might guillotine him in half. Now here is another one. Here's the girdle, tail end attached here and beginning to show some color differences in the body. You can almost see through the skin. And all of a sudden you see the skin split apart up here. And this is a about a day after he hung himself up there. So something's happened to him. And as the skin comes off, and this comes off in about a minute or two, and as the skin comes off, suddenly we're left with the chrysalis. So it's important to note the chrysalis formed inside the caterpillar's skin. So here we have a chrysalis. This one now is about a, a, a week aged. Uh, again, we see the girdle here, tail attached. And, and nice strong uh, chrysalis here, keeps the weather off. And the next thing's gonna be is the adults going to emerge from it. And here's the adult crawling out. And here we have three adults that have come out within the last hour. This one's been out the longest time, it's been out about an hour. This one just came out. And you can see he's got a big belly because he's got extra hemolymph or blood in his belly and his wings are all folded up. And you can imagine this all folded up and coming out of here. This guy, there's no way he fit back inside here, but that's because he let his, he hung upside down, he let his crumpled wings kind of hang underneath him. And then if you look here and you see this yellow vein here, it splits and then there's another vein here. He pumped that extra hemolymph that was in the abdomen into the wings and it causes them to spread out and straighten and then gravity takes over and then he sits there until everything dries and it may take an hour or two and he's almost ready to fly on and live. The last thing he's got to do is get his proboscis ready because when it comes out, it's in two pieces. And so he's got to fold it and you'll watch him. He's working it back and forth and as it, as it uh, coils and uncoils, it begins to get joined and he's almost got the two pieces together yet. So he's about ready to take off and go see the world. And another term for uh, emerging is eclosing. Yes. So you would, that would be a, a correct term to use. You never say butterflies hatch, uh, caterpillars hatch and butterflies either emerge or eclose. And now we're gonna move on to our second swallowtail species that we'll be discussing. This is the Eastern tiger. As we said, this is a state insect of Virginia. 
On the left there is the female, on the right is the male. And here is that dark form, that dark morph female, uh, again, the melanistic um, form that the, they can take. Um, this is actually an example of Batesian mimicry, which Steve is gonna talk about in a little more detail in a moment. Um, and in this case, they're actually mimicking the distasteful pipevine swallowtail. So you will tend to have more of these dark morphs. We have, we have quite a few of these in our yard if you also have a lot of pipevine swallowtails in your area. And here's another view of, of this one is actually nectaring on goldenrod, which is a terrific um, late uh, blooming nectar plant. And goldenrod doesn't give you hay fever. That's ragwort yeah. that comes out at the same time. And here's one nectaring on buttonbush. Uh, tigers absolutely adore so. buttonbush. It's a wonderful um, bush. It also a lot of pollinators uh, and small uh, butterflies uh, like it. Oh, you know, lots of different things. Um, and a little gardening tip, um, if you deadhead the dead flowers, you'll get a nice second bloom. The host plants for the Eastern tiger, uh, the, the, most pre the, the, the one primarily in this area is tulip poplar. Uh, they will also lay on swamp bay magnolia and, magnolia and native black cherry. Here you see she has found a leaf, curved her abdomen and is going to deposit that egg. All right, and here is a little caterpillar just about to hatch from its egg. Here it comes. Oh, almost, almost out. Yay, and then it does its, uh, its little happy dance. Um, this is all of the instars uh, of the Eastern tiger. And uh, don't you love how well behaved is that we just got them to line right yeah. up? No, I'm just yeah. kidding. Not really. We uh, actually staged this shot to show you uh, how the different instars look. In some species of butterflies, uh, like the Eastern tiger, they can look very different at each of those instars. In others, like the monarch, they're going to look about the same. Um, in, in all in stars. And as Karen mentioned on her shirt in the very first picture, uh, the the last in star had turned from green to brown. And uh, but it is not a different in star. It was just a, uh, a ch color change. And here is an example of the molting. Uh, this caterpillar has secured itself with silk. This is a very vulnerable time uh, and can uh, last almost 24 hours. So they need to make sure they're very securely attached. Um, and then it literally, as Steve said, has kind of walked out of its old cuticle or skin and it will probably turn around and eat that. And I should have mentioned also the uh, caterpillar when it hatches from its egg mm -hmm. will typically turn around and eat that egg. It's thought that there's some nutrition there and maybe also kind of to get rid of the evidence that, that they were there. And here's the osmotarium on the Eastern tiger. This is the uh, pipevine swallowtail. Again, this is the one that the dark form uh, uh, tiger females are mimicking. This is a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. A couple of shots of it. And its host plant is uh, Aristolochia, any species of that. This happens to be uh, Aristolochia macrophylla or Dutchman's pipevine so named because it's thought that its flower looks like a meerschaum pipe. And this is one of the few butterfly species that lays its eggs in a cluster. And when the caterpillars hatch, uh, the little hatchlings stay together and actually go leaf to leaf as a group eating, they're gregarious. And, and they do that even in the later uh, in stars and then eventually go off on their own. And although this is a very uh, scary looking caterpillar, it's actually harmless as are all butterfly caterpillars in this area. Now there are a few moth caterpillars that you wanna watch out for that have, um, that are, have venomous uh, spines that are toxic. So you want to watch out for those, but no, butterfly caterpillars can look scary, but they are actually harmless. And this is their chrysalis and it can be in the uh, multiple colors. Okay, we're going to move on to the zebra swallowtail and it, uh, appropriately named because of the stripes. Um, again, on the uh, scabiosa here. Um, 
beautiful butterfly and people say, gosh, Steve, I haven't seen that butterfly around. And there's a great reason because its host plant is called pawpaw. And it is, here it is nectaring on uh, the milkweed flower, but pawpaw is a tree that grows in understory wet areas. It grows a lot in, in this area, but only in areas that are wet and understory. And as a result, not everyone has that in their neighborhood. So mom, mom is not going to go very far from where she's got to lay her eggs because she's got to lay eggs, eat, lay eggs and eat. And so she's going to stay close by. We actually saw uh, a, a zebra, the, it's about the second, first, second year we hear it said, well, there's got to be a tree in the woods somewhere nearby, but I want to bring some into my yard. So we went out and bought this little tree and planted it. And sure enough, you can see her abdomen's down. She's tasted this leaf. That's pawpaw, she says, and she's laying an egg. If you plant it, they will come. And this is a couple of cats. Um, again, this one has just uh, placed his, his tail end in a spot of silk. He molted inside and he's literally walking out of his old skin and onto the next instar. And I should say that you just used the abbreviation we often use for caterpillars, which is cats. And a quick funny story is we were in a grocery store one day and talking as we were getting groceries. And Steve said, well, how many um, cats do you think we have in the garage right now? And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe three or 400. And someone nearby jaw dropped and it was pretty, pretty funny. Uh, they thought we were real <laughs> <laughs> crazy cat people. <laughs> uh, this is a spice bush swallowtail. A couple of images here of it. And this is one nectaring uh, on uh, Pentas. The host plants for it are spice bush and sassafras. And here's a video we took in the butterfly house um, of some sassafras that was on display uh, and the females found were, were finding it and just, you know, laying eggs like crazy. And it really is just that quick, what you just saw, you know, land, boom, and, and she's on to the next, find the next leaf. Uh, the spice bush caterpillars have a really interesting uh, defense uh, in that they actually will lay down silk on a leaf and as it dries, it contracts the leaf around them. Some people call them little tacos. That's a good way to find them on your trees actually is look for those uh, and that's a protection for them. And they have these amazing false eyes um, and they can actually, they're trying to look snake-like to scare off predators. And they can actually even rear up their uh, head and thorax uh, and look even more menacing. Mm -hmm. Here's a good close up. That's the actual head. And those are the little eyes that Steve is showing there, the Ocelli. There are six simple eyes on each side of the head. And it's almost like they pull a hoodie, you know, over them as a disguise with that, you know, awesome, scary looking big, big eye. Um, but that is their actual little head there that you see. And some of you may have heard of Caterpie. Uh, the Pokemon character, it was actually patterned after the real spice bush caterpillar because that caterpillar is just so awesome. It has the, the fake eyes and this, you can see it even, uh, that is supposed to be, I believe, an ospitarium. Okay, now here on the left is the uh, spice bush swallowtail. And here is one that looks a little bit like them. Doesn't have the eyebrows and, oh my gosh, look at those eyes. Eyes bulging, those have got to be real eyes. Uh -uh, <laughs> they're still fake eyes. Uh, and, and this is a cousin of, of his, and this is the Palamede swallowtail caterpillar. And here's another view. This one just really shows how that eye seems to bulge out and have real depth to it and even a little sheen like it's reflecting light. Has an Oz material like all the other uh, swallowtails. Here's the adult. Uh, nice large butterfly, great, great looking visitor to the garden. Uh, stands tall, look at the length of that uh, proboscis there, mm -hmm. dipping down into get a sip of nectar. Now, uh, wanna look at the uh, taxonomy here a little bit of these two, uh, go on down insects, Lepidoptera. Okay, genuses are the same, Papilio, and then this is Troilus 
for the spice bush, and this is Palamedes for the Palamedes. Okay, so they're cousins. And actually, these guys um, uh, were able to uh, uh, mate. Uh, we don't know what the, the uh, results were of this. Um, now, uh, females may mate multiple times, and typically the subsequent mating becomes the dominant sperm in, in her supply uh, as she's producing or fertilizing the eggs one at a time. So probably she uh, did mate and, and, you know, it wasn't anything uh, comparison between the two. But these are the plants that they eat. Again, this is spice bush and this is sassafras. And they're in the Larisae family. And then also in here is the uh, uh, red bay, which is the host plant that these uh, Palamedes eats. So the Palamedes has got red bay. Or swamp bay. Or swamp bay, mm -hmm. which we have locally. Uh, and then over here, we have um, um, uh, sassafras and um, pipe, uh, um, um, spice bush. Spice bush. And, mm -hmm. They actually, when their t leaves are tender, they can swap. And that's really important because this little guy has been coming into the, he came to the country almost 20 years ago near Savannah. And he, his main feature is he likes to drill into sassafras, red bay, and uh, uh, spice bush plants and deposit little egg havens. Now, when he's drilling his holes, he's got a, um, uh, a, a, a microbe or a spore on him that helps the plant get softened up so his, his children can eat, but Just softening up kills the trees, and these trees can literally die in a couple of months. And so if you see a spice bush or a sassafras tree or a red bay tree suddenly start losing its leaves. Look for the little, the little toothpicks, which are frass, a combination of frass and uh, sawdust, and look for the toothpicks and then call the state agricultural people in a hurry. Now it started here in Savannah. In just a few years, it was to Wilmington and all the way into Florida. Some reason it didn't come up into our area yet. However, right here, this year in June, it jumped over the state line and came to the Scott County, Virginia. So it's likely we may be getting it here. Uh, so if you see one of those trees becoming damaged, call the state. Okay, last swallowtail, giant swallowtail. He's our biggest swallowtail, and that's why we call him a giant. What's basically our largest butterfly, well, I would basically say. Basically, our yeah. largest butterfly here. Um, his the host plant is. Uh, is in the family that includes rue and citrus trees. I think that citrus trees, he really grows big down in Florida. Oh, he loves orange trees. Yeah, he does. His caterpillars are called orange dogs. Now this is the Viceroy. Looks a little bit like a monarch. So this is a mimic. And here's a discussion on mimicry. Now Batesian mimicry is a common. That's what the uh, dark form tiger is to the um, arachidonia, the uh, pipevine swallowtail. It's mimicking, trying to take advantage of the bad reputation of him. In this case, the monarch gets cardenolides from the milkweed it, its caterpillar eats. The viceroy gets salicylic acid from the willow that its caterpillars eat. So they both are distasteful to birds. Actually, if a bird eats the monarch, within a couple of minutes, he'll spit it up. So both of them are distasteful. So the, the message is, if it's orange butterfly, don't eat it. And that's called malarian mimicry. Now, this is uh, some eggs here, here. And I think there's one at the top, which I can't see, of the, of the viceroy. Looks like an Epcot dome here. This is the caterpillar. And uh, he's not very attractive, and that's on purpose. He doesn't want to be eaten, right? This is the plant he also eats. In addition to the willow, he will eat uh, the uh, uh, black uh, cherry, cherry mm -hmm. and he also will eat cottonwood leaves. Now, this is a red-spotted purple, which is a cousin of the viceroy. They're both in the same genus, just a different species. Uh, its caterpillar looks virtually the same, although the, the butterfly doesn't look anything like the viceroy. 
but his caterpillar does. He's all curled up here. Looks like a spot of bird dropping, and that's a defense. What bird wants to eat after another one, right? Now, these things do something interesting. We're going to think about the swallowtails again. They got those nice, sturdy chrysalises. They're able in the winter time, rather than emerging soon, they spend the whole winter in a chrysalis and they come out in the spring when it warms up. They actually have an antifreeze. They have right antifreeze now. in, in the antifreeze. Uh, in, inside the, the chrysalis. And so that's how they spend their winters. These guys spend winters as second instar caterpillars. They have the antifreeze in the caterpillar stage. And so he has taken a leaf and then he's making a silk coating over it. This is called a hibernaculum. And he will hibernate in essence all winter in there. And then in the spring, when when it comes at when the, the leaves come out, he'll start to eat. Okay, we're gonna move very quickly through just some last of our uh, common species. Um, and I did want to mention, I, did you mention that uh, the two, the red spotted and the viceroy being related genuses? We did actually uh, one time have a caterpillar that when it emerged as a, a butterfly, it was a hybrid. It was a hybrid between the two. So there the obviously two. had been a mating between uh, the two species. Um, so all of the butterflies um, have multiple generations from uh, all the, we have multiple generations of caterpillars of all of our butterfly species from spring to fall, anywhere from two to four we can even sometimes get a fifth generation of uh, monarchs. And as Steve said, they all have different ways of being able to spend the winter. All the swallowtails overwinter as chrysalises, the red spotted and viceroy as that early instar caterpillar in their hibernaculum. Um, hibernaculi would be the plural. Uh, and then some actually um, emigrate. They don't make that big migration you're gonna hear about on Friday that the monarchs do where they go all the way to Mexico, uh, but they do E-M-I-G-R-A-T-E, -E, emigrate and just go south a few um, uh, states to the southern states. Uh, and that's the, that, that would be the case with the uh, red admiral you just saw, its host plant is false nettles. The buckeye also immigrates. Um, here it's nectaring on um, monarda or bee balm. Host plants are gerardia and plantain. Now the question mark actually overwinters as an adult butterfly in like, uh, you know, finds shelter somewhere, uh, wood piles, uh, uh, you know, have other places like that. Uh, here it's nectaring on black eyed Susan or Rudbeckia. And it's called the question mark because of that symbol on its hind, way, uh, hind wing. Uh, here is one puddling and another good look at that. And there is actually also a comma butterfly that is very similar looking. It just doesn't have the dot uh, in its punctuation mark. Um, and this is the question mark caterpillar here on L. And they also eat hops. Uh, and in uh, when they're resting, the caterpillar even kind of takes that question mark uh, position. Okay, now here is a beautiful uh, uh, meadow of flowers. And when you have a lot of flowers, you are going to have a lot of butterflies. And so these are all um, in the um, it's all echinacea, echinacea, Purple and in. and these are fritillaries, variegated fritillaries, and a pretty butterfly. Um, this is its chrysalis. It's very small, but that copper color is just very stunning. And here is the caterpillar on the left, and this one is eating passion flower vine. And he also, uh, the, the caterpillars will also eat uh, violets, but there's someone else eating this passion flower vine. And this is a gulf fritillary. Remember the gulf? That's the one that was our first one that we raised. And we do get them up. We're at the very north end of their flight pattern here. And this is the passion flower vine. And so this is the gulf. And here is an acrobatic female, and it is a vine, so it has tendrils that it attaches with. And you can just barely see she's depositing a little yellow egg right there on the end of that tendril. Okay, this is the American snout, very aptly named. Uh, host plant for it is hackberry. This is the painted lady. Host plant is uh, primarily thistle. Uh, then we have the American lady, host plant Cudweed, uh, pussy toes, uh, the pearl crescent, which uh, hosts on uh, asters, and it actually overwinters as a uh, third instar caterpillar. 
on the left here, you see the smaller one is the Pearl Crescent. The larger is the silvery checker spot. Now here in Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach area, we don't get the silvery checker spot. It's more Richmond uh, West. We actually took this picture at uh, Natural, Natural Bridge. Bridge. Oh, and the host plant for the silvery checker spot are um, uh, primarily sunflowers and black eyed Susan. Now this is the tiny but beautiful little eastern tail blue. Host is clover. So if you look very carefully there, this is a female laying an egg on that little tiny clover flower. And here is the beautiful uh, dorsal view of that one. Moving on now to hair streaks. This is a gray hair streak. Prefers uh, its caterpillars prefer plants in the pea or uh, mallow family as host. Uh, the banded hair streak, which hosts on hickory, oak, and walnut, and all of the hair streaks have those appendages. Uh, can you get the video? There you go. Those appendages on its uh, their hind wings. They are trying to make those look like antennas and full predators and thinking that is their head in so that the predators, if they come, might, if they wanna take a, a nip, they would hopefully take it from that end, which won't kill the, the butterfly. Obviously the head in would be deadly. And this is the great purple hair streak. The host for this uh, butterfly is mistletoe. This is an absolutely gorgeous, probably the largest of the hair streaks, but still you know, a fairly small, small butterfly. But look at the colors on it. Look at that abdomen, two-toned mm. abdomen. It's really, really a pretty, pretty butterfly. Very common cabbage white. This is a female because of the two dots, the males have one and they host on anything uh, typically in the cruciferous family, uh, cabbage, broccoli, kale. Uh, the cloudless sulfur host is senna and cassia. Uh, this one going in for a deep dive there in that flower. This is the long-tailed skipper. They host uh, on uh, plants in the legume family. I love this shot that Steve got of one flying in, proboscis, unfurled, ready for action to get that nectar. And then this is a tiny, tiny little skipper. I don't know. I don't even know if it's much, not much larger than a dime. A dime, yeah. Um, and uh, the lace winged roadside skipper. It is just exquisite. And we're going to conclude with this skipper species. This is the silver spotted skipper. Um, it hosts on native wisteria. Here are two of its caterpillars. And I think with those fake eyes, this one almost looks like a alien. Um, it also, when it's disturbed, it actually uh, can regurgitate a very bitter tasting uh, greenish uh, defensive chemical. And here's another neat fact. This caterpillar can actually increase the blood pressure in its hind end and propel its frass, and that's just a fancy word for caterpillar poop. It can propel its frass 38 body lengths. Now, how cool is that? Man, that's... I mean, we can't make this stuff up. And this is its um, pupa, um, both as caterpillars and when it's pupating, it makes leaf shelters by sewing uh, leaves together with silk. And uh, yeah, I really do think that kind of looks like a little manatee. And so now you know, we, we see the sun is setting and it's time for us to uh, head in uh, from the garden and we thank you for your attention and if there's time we're happy to answer any questions you might have and with that we'll turn it back to uh, Alex. Thank you guys so much for such an amazing class. Um, so we do have a few questions here in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and read those out for you guys. Okay. Um, so going back in the presentation we do have a question. Um, how is a puddler created? How is a put? It's it's basically anywhere that there's wet ground, and, and some people in their gardens will actually uh, create an area that has sand, um, kind of like a bird bath, except at the ground level, and you just need it to be not really wet, but just a little bit moist. And um, maybe put a few rocks for them. To you might put a, a few rocks down there yeah. also to to help contribute to the salts, but it's. Well, uh, for them to kind of sit on is there yeah yeah, or, yeah. Or, or and too, uh, and so it's uh, it, it basically it's something that you're going to see i know people talk about going out to uh 
the um, Great Dismal Great Swamp, Dismal Swamp mm -hmm. and just see seeing ruts in the roads out yep. there and wet spots and seeing a bunch of butterflies puddling around uh, those wet spots. So, uh, but if you want to create a puddling area, the, the simplest thing is just, you know, have a place that's going to kind of tend to stay moist and put a little sand on it and, and, um, and, and give them a place to puddle. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question here um, from Anne. It says, where's the best source for single flower zinnia seeds? Uh, she says that her double flower zinnias have attracted no butterflies this past summer. Do you have a recommendation on where to source seeds? Oh. Yeah, you, you found that out when you got some zinnias that oh, gosh, the, yeah. some of the new, um, um, not, uh, the, the, the hybrids and, uh, and the- uh, Have uh, no, don't, don't really have- Don't nectar, produce nectar. In other nectar. words, they're, the, the more they fool with the flowers, the, the less nectar they, it's not important for them to produce nectar. And so they go for color and, and style rather than nectar. So you do and want so, to look for the heir, heirloom, I think heirloom, it's called seeds. If you can find heirloom. You know a good source. Um, <laughs> I, I, I get mine online. Or? I, I get mine at, at, at Amazon. First thing I do is I Google uh, butterflies and zinnias and uh, and uh, and other flowers. And there's about four or five. Um, there's cut, cut and cut again. Cut and cut again uh, is there's one. A and there's that a are recommended. A, a fair. I can't think of what of those. So sometimes at some of the um, like at the flower and garden shows and things, there are sometimes people there that have. Um, uh, uh, vendors that have seeds, and I've noticed sometimes they'll have the heirloom. So I have, and they'll specifically have heirloom. So yeah. if you go like the flower and garden show at the first of the year, you might find some there. Um, the, the, the beautiful orange uh, cosmos that I have, I, literally that thing's as tall as I am. And it was a pack of seeds I picked up somewhere at a giveaway a couple of years ago. It said Cosmos Orange. And so I, I, I started a tray of them this spring and they kept growing taller <laughs> and taller and taller. They've and, been a real favorite. And, they're, and, they're beautiful. And yeah. oh, the, it just, it, it's a great favorite. So yeah, um, I, I, I think uh, the, uh, the Garden Center on um, Independence way up there. Um, no. Um, oh, on Independence. Um, McDonald's. McDonald's. I think they have a pretty good seed selection, and you might just go there and and look. But if you can find heirloom, but again, look for the name for the uh, the species name or the the marketing name of the specific kind that you're you're interested in. But but zinnias and cosmos are great. The gardens use that that huge garden out near the butterfly oh. uh, house and everything. Uh, uh, they mow it down in the middle of the summer, replant it, and then uh, by this time, it's just oh, amazing uh, bloom yeah. of flowers. Yeah. Yeah. So I've actually included a link uh, for the website that we source ours and use, um, ah. American Meadows. So I put that the link in the chat. Um, Tom, the horticulturist who does that, has updated himself this year. We did layered blooms throughout the entire season. So we use American Meadows. Um, it's bulk seed mixes. You can buy it per quarter pound up to a pound. Um, and they've got about 70 different types of zinnias <laughs> that you can browse through. So um, I put that in the chat there. Um, we have another I was writing question. it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, got another question here. Um, elaborating on um, what did caterpillars eat before your or Europeans brought members of the carrot family over? Um, well, there, there is an actually a native uh, of, of the carrot family. It's called Zizia. Uh, and the common name is Golden Alexander. Golden Alexander mm -hmm. is, is kind of the, the, the name for it. Uh, there, there may have been Queen Anne's lace here. Now, now you are correct. And, and for the black swallowtails eating the, the fennel and the parsley, those are from the Mediterranean and were brought over by settlers. But we already had the black swallowtail butterflies here. They were caterpillars were eating zizia and probably the Queen Anne's lace. And, uh, and and then they said, "Hey, this tastes just like it." And uh, so the, the carrots and the uh, fennel and the parsley uh, became a hit. Yeah, but we're we're not native plant experts. I don't know. Is rue? I don't have any idea. Uh, not, Eastern blacks will. Eastern blacks will also, also eat the rue. caterpillars. I didn't mention that, but they can also eat rue, like the giant. So I'm not sure. But zizia is definitely a native. Uh, we also have Zizia that it's, uh, we sell it each year at our uh, plant sale too. So that coming up, we'll have that for sale for you guys. Um, I've got a last question here. Um, 
Did you say that the Palamedes swallowtail can also eat spice bush and sassafras like a spice bush, spice bush swallowtail can? We, we, uh, a couple of us at the Butterfly Society have been experimenting with that. Um, and, and, and the first thing we noticed was in the butterfly house, we had both the red bay tree and the sassafras trees in there. And both species were kind of laying occasionally on the other one. And again, since they're very close, they're in the same genus, uh, the, the, the taste of, the, of the, the leaf is pretty similar to mama, especially in, in young leaves. In other words, fresh that really haven't turned hard green yet. And that's where they were laying their eggs. Now we also saw in some cases when the caterpillars tried to eat the harder leaves of those particular trees, uh, we, you would see a revolt and you would see them going down the, the stem to go looking for a better tasting leaf. So uh, mixed success on it, but I, I do know uh, Maurice has raised some, but he, he, he kept tender leaves all the time and was able to, I believe he raised some um, Palamedes on some some very yeah, tender spice bush. Perhaps talk about that tomorrow and, and he, uh, yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, that wraps it up. So I just, again, want to thank you guys for uh, taking your time to do this presentation oh, wow. with us. It's oh, been our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and um, again, just to remind you guys, this record or this recording will be shared with the entire class roster, so you guys will get a link providing uh, that info. So thank you I guys so just, much. Yeah, can I say something real yeah, quick, Alex? Like, if, if any questions arise to anybody later, feel please feel free to email us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at Butterfly Society of VA, O-F-V-A dot org, or message us on our Facebook page. And we're always happy to take your questions yep. and we can answer those there. And I'll put that information into the email with the link too, just so you guys have that all in one space. So with that, um, everyone have a great evening and tune in for the rest of the week's uh, virtual programming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. everyone. Good night.